pray together. Lord, we thank you that you are the one that we can go to anytime and all the time. And Lord, we thank you that even together as we worship you, our souls have been lifted up. We have been so encouraged from Cruz baptism to, to the gathering of the family, to all the prayers and all of the songs. Lord, you have spoken into our hearts. And I pray now as we open your word that you will speak to us. Lord, help me to, to get out of the way so that your word would be heard and not only heard, but applied into every life. Use me as your voice today and, and speak, Lord, by your spirit in ways that even maybe I don't say explicitly, I pray that you'll speak to every heart deeper than words. And so, Lord, we bring our struggles to you today. We bring our trials and our, our, our suffering, our pain, all of us in varying degrees. And we thank you that we can come before you. You meet us right where we are. And it awes us today. We can call you Father. And we thank you for your presence. We thank you for Jesus, for the hope of salvation and resurrection. And we pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. It's great to see you today. I'm so glad you're here. Um, how many were here last week, by the way? Some, a few of you were here. Yes, a lot of you here. Um, today is Resurrection Day. You know that, right? That's why we meet on Sundays. Uh, we say that, you know, Easter is a time when everybody who comes here at any point actually shows up on the same day uh, with a lot of friends. So I'm saying this to you, way to go, way to be back today. I mean, this is the pattern of a believer's life. We're going to talk a lot about that today. And I just want to offer a, um, just a celebration as a church family. We had some 4,000 people uh, with us across the campus last week. And you all inviting friends, our deacons, our staff, and all of you just serving our people. And what a great day it is to start off with baptism and we just celebrate new life and, and salvation. Celebrate all of our guests who are here. I've met some of you who are new this morning, and we have a special guest with us today. The Honorable Jeff Dewana is here with us, and he's here with some other dignitaries. He is the U.S. Ambassador from uh, Liberia, who was in the fan class uh, earlier, uh, men's class. Uh, so the Honorable, would you stand? We want to honor you. We're so glad that you're here today. Welcome. Welcome. And other friends. We're glad you're here. Amen. You bless us with your presence, and we hope that you are blessed by being with us. Liberia is a beautiful, spent a lot of time in Africa. It's a beautiful country on the far west of um, the continent and on the coast, where we all wish we, we were today, on the coast of Africa. But we are glad that you're all here today. Now you can hear me. This is good. Okay, you haven't heard anything I said up to this point. Is that, is that what's happening? Um, no, we're glad that you're here today. I want you to um, go and grab your Bible. We're going to be in, uh, in the book of Psalms. We're going to actually be in Psalm 42 uh, today as we um, start a new series of messages. So some uh, years ago, several years ago, I was finishing the run portion of a, of a triathlon. It was a, um, it was a half Ironman in Austin and, um, back when I did those kinds of crazy things. And I was uh, almost near the finish line. And I uh, felt something in my left knee. It's like, okay, I've got something going on. And um, I finished the race. It wasn't, again, wasn't very far. And I finished. And so a couple weeks after the race, I thought, well, I'm going to get back out there. and get back to it. And uh, so I started running again. And sure enough, uh, something's wrong. Long, long story short, I went to physical therapist, sought some help, some counsel. I wanted to, you know, start talk to a couple doctors. Um, sure enough, find out I have a torn meniscus. And uh, so I talked to my friend, uh, Dr. Tyler Cooper, some of you know Tyler at the Cooper Clinic, who's a member of our church, and, and he's a dear friend, and he knows a little bit about um, sports medicine and holistic health. And uh, he said, Jeff, okay, here's the thing. Um, surgery is a good option if it's your last option. So I thought, okay, this is good. So we kept working on this and trying to make it better and all the things. Couldn't, it wouldn't happen, right? Ultimately had to go and have surgery to try to get it fixed so that I just do, do my normal things without pain. I share that story because many of you have been there. And if you haven't yet, it's simply because you're not old enough. Okay, that's, that's part of the deal. But some of you have been there. Here's the thing. When we have physical ailments, we're, we're quick to get help, right? 
We, we can diagnose it pretty quick, like that hurts and I need help. I don't know what to do about it. And it's not going away. And yet when it comes to mental health and uh, mental illness and, 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 and just holistic health, when we struggle with anxiety and depression and these kinds of things, we don't often know what to do. I think there's a lot of reasons for that. It's harder to diagnose. We wonder, is this normal or not, what I'm going through? And I think, un, unfortunately, in, in, in North Dallas, in particular, in Christian culture even, the subculture, we, we can say, um, hey, you know, everything's okay. I, I know Jesus. I should have enough faith. I'm happy all the time. And that is not Christianity. Christianity is not you come to Jesus and everything will go well with you. That's a prosperity gospel. That's not the gospel. The gospel is you come to Jesus and whatever life brings your way, he is with you and you're going to be able to make it and even glorify him through it. That's the truth of the applied gospel. So a few months ago, our mayor, uh, Tommy Stewart, some of you know Tommy, um, came to my office upon his request, wanted to sit down and talk about the issues that we're facing in our culture, in our community in particular, in the Park Cities and UP specifically. So we, we started to talk and then we gathered um, a group of faith leaders together, just so grateful for his his leadership and, and just desire to do this. We pulled together public safety, uh, UP police. We pulled together the um, HPISD uh, counselors and different leaders within our community. And we began to talk about the issues facing uh, our, our community. One thing rose to the top quickly, uh, and it is this issue of mental health and, and wellness, particularly among our young people. Our middle school and, and high school um, counselors will tell you that the problem in our community is, and in, this is North Dallas, this is, again, it's a, kind of a Christian subculture thing, I think, in a lot of ways, is silence. We don't talk about it. We somehow, bring, we, we think that we should be okay, and we often don't talk to our own family members. We don't talk to our neighbors, and what we're trying to do on this day, in particular, all of our faith leaders are speaking to this from our pulpits today. And we are, are going to take a deep dive. It actually coincides with a series of messages in the Psalms, not all about mental health. Next week, we're going to talk about exhaustion and, and overwork. We're going to talk about real life because that's what the Bible speaks to, and especially in the Psalms, right? The Psalms holds nothing back when it comes to these issues. Uh, but the issue that has risen to the top is the issues around um, depression, anxiety, and, and mental health. Often we try to fix it ourselves, which can lead to all kinds of problems of self-medication, which is why depression and addiction often go together. We want to normalize conversations around our struggles. That's what we want to do. So here, um, again, it coincides with our reading of the Psalms. We're in the Psalms now together. We're reading all the Psalms through this season. And we are... Uh, we're focusing in on, on reading God's word together as a family. And, and that's going to be the great challenge for you in application. If you're not in the word of God daily, I want to ask you why you're not. And I say it often. If you're a Christian, at some point, you're going to have to open your Bible. You're going to have to dive in and know the word of God. Not just know it, like come to a class where somebody gives you a download, but to be in it. Because we're seeking to know Jesus and to walk with him daily. But again, the, the psalmist doesn't hold back suffering and grief and loneliness, anxiety, even what we call today suicide ideation. It's all in the psalms. And Psalm 42 is a great place to launch. So we're going to look at Psalm 42, if you'll turn there. And uh, we're going to talk about the problem. We're going to talk about the solution. And we're going to talk about the hope that we have. The first thing I want to talk about is the problem. The problem is alienation. Not just isolation, but alienation. Uh, alienation from God, alienation from others. Watch this. You may know this. You'll, you're you're going to catch this, some of you. The first verse. As the deer, as the deer pants, as the deer panteth for the waters, for flowing streams out of the ESV, so pants my soul for you, O God. The psalmist is saying here, I'm the deer, God is the riverbank, and the riverbed is completely dry. Have you ever been there? Some of you come into this room today and you are there. 
We've all walked through spiritual drought. Depression can feel like a spiritual drought. It can feel like God is, is nowhere to be found. This is not Psalm 1 where his roots run deep beside the, the, the streams of, of flowing water. It's, it's not the place where you're receiving life and you're planted by the streams of, of living water. This is alienation from God. It's a big part of depression. So verse 1 is metaphorical. Verse 2 is explicit. Look at this. My soul thirsts for God. For the living God. When shall I come and appear before God? Notice how self-aware he is. Okay? First of all, he's expressing what's going on in his heart. He's saying it out loud. He's writing it down. And, and he's parched. He's depressed. But what he lacks is, look at this, the presence of God. He's not questioning the existence of God. You, you can, you can be, a, be a, not only a theist, you can be a Christian and walk through seasons of in fact, it's normal in the Christian life to go through a season of spiritual drought. You know, those who don't know God, I've thought about this, this this week, those who don't turn to the Lord. And that could be all of us in varying degrees, but those who don't know God, we all cry out to a God. Everybody does so. And that can turn, again, to self-medication. Prescribed medication and therapy, that's a good thing, can be a really good thing. But the psalmist knows Whichever avenue we take here, all healing comes from the Lord. Don't miss that. That's why we turn to Him and not to everything else alone. We turn to Him first and foremost. Because only God will satisfy the kind of thirst that the soul has. And this is in every area of life. Don't waste your time seeking out those things that will not permanently satisfy you. Let me ask you this. Where do you go? Where do you run? The Lord knows in your mind, even before him now, what kind of self-medication do you run to? Are you binging on alcohol, Netflix, bad habits, bad relationships, unhealthy relationships? Where do you turn? Turn to God. Turn to him. That's a reminder for some of us today. The last line of verse 2, he's asking when will I see literally the face of God again in the Hebrew? He's missing the countenance of God, not the reality of God, but the presence of God. And again, this is normal in the Christian life. Notice he's done nothing wrong. He hasn't done anything wrong. Walking through times of spiritual deadness and drought is a normal part of the Christian life. We're seeking to normalize conversations around this. Look at verse 3. My tears have been my food day and night while they say to me all the day long, where is your God? Mental illness can drive us to grief and uh, to, to a lot of pain and anguish and can always bring the hard questions. But look at this. At the same time, as we walk through these seasons, it can be a sign of your faithfulness to God as he is faithful to you rather than running from your emotions that we, we just in our feelings we we don't ignore our struggles and our trials we take them to the Lord even when he feels distant and this is a hard thing to do we struggle to know his presence but we keep turning to him and friends listen to this this is faithfulness to walk through these seasons of darkness, and we all will go through them, but to continue to come to God himself. This is a proclamation of faith. Don't miss this. You can be faithful even when you feel as if God is not present in your life. Now, we don't know who they are. He says they are saying, where is your God? Could be some taunting, some, some voices coming at him, but could it be that it's his own voice? Isn't that most of the place, mostly the place we live? The challenge is that we are often talking to ourselves. Where is your God? Not, again, the absence of his existence, but the absence of his presence. He's feeling that God has abandoned him. Have you ever felt that way before? Notice, too, what we see here. Tears are his food day and night. This is another sign. Not eating. Not sleeping. And he's, he's made a determination. If, if tears are all I've got to sustain me, then tears it will be. This is faith on display. Because you see, what happens is oftentimes we think that this will never end. Some of you are there today. 
We've been in seasons where we feel like, I don't know if this will never end. And what we don't want to hear is, it might not. How can you be faithful through it all? We're going to see it here. But this is when we become hopeless. Tim Keller is the one who, who said that the opposite of joy is not sadness, it's hopelessness. Have you been there before? It, it, it's when we think, I'll never again do this. We've resigned. Some of you are there today. I'll never again feel this way or, or, or experience this again. But notice too, he, he's, he's not turning to other forms of self-medication. He's not, he's not drinking. He's not entering into sexual sin. He's not, he's not pursuing these things that will not sustain him. This is real faith. This is what I want you to hear. This is real faith to know that in times of crisis, we can continue to pursue God, and that is, that is real faith. And others are watching, by the way. This is not to shame you or, or heap guilt on you, but others are watching. And even if it's the small steps of faithfulness, others can see that in your life, in your family. And, and, and sometimes, as we'll note, sometimes it's just doing the next thing. It's just getting out of bed. And that will be faithfulness for you, you see. Look at verse 4. These things I remember as I pour out my soul, how I, would, how I would go with the throng and lead them in procession to the house of God and glad shouts and songs of praise, a multitude-keeping festival. He's remembering how things used to be. He was a leader. And when things were great, he's remembering the good old days. Okay, He's not in close proximity with God or God's people. This is how mental health functions. Our mental illness can function this way. It, it, it can alienate us from God and from others. Here's the challenge. And if you've been here, you know that this is the case. People, see, when we walk through mental health uh, or challenges, we need people in our lives. But we don't want people in our lives. What do you do? What do you do? How, how can I show myself at church? How can I show up if I'm not 100%? Listen, can we say at Mass Confession, none of us are at 100% today. And if you're here and you're just 20%, if you're thinking, I made it here, listen, that is faithfulness. There are many people who are not present today because when they walk through times of anxiety or depression, oftentimes social anxiety is, is heightened. And they haven't even shown up today. And you've been there perhaps before. And friends, what I want to challenge you with, with is, is this. That is a huge mistake to, to alienate yourself. And this is, this is life in, in post-pandemic um, America, by the way. Many people, uh, and clearly this was true right after the pandemic, we started to see, okay, who's back and who's not? This is a national thing, even international thing. I mean, I was, I was in Africa last summer. This is true in Africa. This is all over the world. Many people have gotten out of the habit. And I believe the Lord has been refining his church. Who's in and who's not? Some are saying, you know, I remember we, we joke about it. I kind of like watching church online. I'm in my pajamas and drinking my coffee. I kind of like that. Tragic mistake. Unless you're unable to be here, even today, or on vacation this summer. Continue to join us, yes, online, but there's nothing like being together. And here's why. Listen, many of you today, you've already sensed it, you felt it. When you don't have faith, when you don't feel like God is near to you, when you don't want to worship, watch this, let us worship for you. Let someone next to you worship for you. When you don't want to sing, let somebody around you sing. This is the body of Christ, friends. It's why corporate, that does not happen alone. It's why corporate worship is so critical and it needs to be the constant habit of every believer. This is not a, this, it's not a legalistic thing. This is a deeply spiritual thing. We've been proclaiming truth all morning long. What the psalmist knows is he cannot, he cannot experience the, the faith that he desires to have alone. He needs others to bolster this in his life. 
He has experienced a disruption of community is what's happened. And watch this. Don't be surprised when this happens in your life. We all go through seasons where we need to reconstruct our community, our common unity of believers in our lives. Some people say, well, I'm not, that, I'm not in that connect group anymore. And we drift away and we don't connect with another. Or we, we, a, a friend moves. Well, I lost my best friend. I don't know what I'm going to do. And we go into loneliness and despair. We get divorced. We move to a new city like Dallas. And we show up and we don't know what to do. Don't be surprised when you have to reconstruct your friend group constantly during seasons of life. But you've got to stay faithful and reach out to others. This is God's plan for you. We're never meant to live alone. And what happens with our, our mental illness and challenges that we face is we tend to alienate and isolate ourselves. Don't let it happen. Friends, stay in. Alan Noble, who is a professor at Oklahoma Baptist University, he, he's an author, professor, written some great books. He's got a new book uh, entitled On Getting Out of Bed. And, and he says, he says, as he has struggled with, with mental illness and, and challenges, do the next thing. This is why I applaud many of you who are here today. Today, for some of you, Sunday morning is, is, is the most um, anxious time of your week. And you're here. That is faithfulness. That is faith in action, and I applaud you for it. Doing the next thing might just be getting out of bed. It might just be going to see that person. It might be, I'm going to have breakfast now. Do the next thing. And watch this. You're glorifying God by doing so. You're, you're praising him in doing that will be enough. And friends, let, let's continue to just press on in him and, and to keep running to him. The problem is alienation. The solution is perseverance. Now, you're waiting on, wait, wait, where are the three points that I'm supposed to, do? then I do that and I'm okay. That's not the way life works, and we all know it. Perseverance is the solution. We get to the chorus of this song. The refrain is in verse 5 and verse 11. It comes back around. And this, by the way, this uh, song keeps going in Psalm 42. It's a long, longer song. Look at verse 5. Why are you cast down, O my soul? Notice he's speaking to his soul. This is critical. This is so important. Sometimes we, we need to stop listening to our soul, to our own minds, and to the lies that we've come to believe. We not need to speak truth into our soul. This is a, a big point today. And why are you in turmoil within me? Hope in God, for I shall again praise him, my salvation and my God. The prominent question when we walk through seasons of despair and depression, the common question is why, right? Why? But don't miss this. Why is a prayer. Jesus prayed it when he was on the cross. Why have you abandoned me? You see. We, but the psalmist is reminding himself of the truth of the gospel. The truth of God. Not a false gospel. Not, wow, I'm struggling so there must be something wrong with me. That's not Christianity. Wow, there's something wrong with me. I feel depressed. I must not believe the gospel. Preach the gospel to yourself. You do believe. You can continue to believe. See, the Psalms teach us that even though our feelings are real and we need to address them and express them in appropriate ways, they're not accurate depictions of reality. You need to grasp this today, friends. This is so important. The truth of God. Why are we always telling you? Be in his word every single day. Why are you not reading the Psalms? Why are you not in with it? Many of you are. Hundreds of you are. But everyone should be. Because you're hearing lies all day long. And this is what happens in isolation when we walk through depression. His physical circumstances haven't changed. His emotional and mental state hasn't changed. His, 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 his life is not changing. And his solution, watch this, to make it is prayer. Persevering prayer. He doesn't say, well, that didn't work. I've got to move on to something else. He doesn't do that. He's staying in. Look at verse 6. He is my salvation and my God. My soul is cast down within me. Therefore, look at this. Therefore, I remember you from the land of Jordan and Hermon and Mount Mazar. He, he's describing hills up in Galilee. 
This is, in fact, way, this is where Jesus' ministry was. He's far from Jerusalem, is the point. The presence of God in Jerusalem. He's now up in, uh, in Mount Hermon, is way, what is that, north, northeast of Galilee. So he's way away from God, and he's questioning where is God. But look at how he, he keeps coming back. Look at verse 7. Deep calls to deep. At the roar of your waterfalls, all your breakers and your waves have gone over me. This constant barrage of waves coming at him. Notice though he says your waves, your waterfall, your breakers. God has spoken all things into existence. And God can bring his power and life into your dark seasons and dead circumstances. And he's doing it today. He's doing it while you're here today. It's why he has brought you here to this place. Because listen, friends, some of you need to hear this. At times of depression and anxiety, mental illness can be, it's like grief. Grief does not have an expiration date on it. We don't get through it. Uh, we, we, we live with it. We don't get over it. But we do press into it. And God gives us strength in it. And we glorify him through it. Look at verse 8. By day the Lord commands his steadfast love. And at night his song is with me. A prayer to the God of my life. Look, despite his night filled with darkness and filled with tears, it's also filled with song. This is so powerful. He keeps singing. Have you ever sung through weeping? Singing and weeping can go together. In fact, some of the great psalms are weeping, like this one, songs to God. Verse 9, I say to God, my rock, why have you forgotten me? Why do I go mourning because of the oppression of my enemy? See, it's common to feel like you're forgotten in times of mental illness. And notice, notice the relapse. Did you catch this? He's up. He's down. Verse 8, he's down. He's, now he's up. He's down. And this is the way it goes, isn't it? So what do we do? I want to pause here for a moment and offer some real application points for you. Okay? In the narthex, uh, our four, you're right in the back and in the commons, um, we have these um, magnets for every person here. Uh, everyone who's here, don't, don't leave without, without grabbing one of these. And if we run out this week, we'll have more next week. Uh, it's a magnet, and you can put it on your fridge, okay? Our team came together and put this together for you. Six family habits for mental health and wellness. And it says here, in this family, our family, this is what we do. Now, if you're single, a lot of us are single adults, you can have this as well. If you're a grandparent, you can enforce this in your house when the grandkids come over. And here's how this plays out. Look at this. Number one, normalize talking openly about our struggles. We need to normalize the conversations around mental illness and, and, and our challenges of anxiety and depression. You're only as sick as your secrets, is what we say often. Pro, uh, practice active listening and value honest communication. We need to honor and value courageous honesty in our families. Look at this next one. Combat negativity with gratitude. Praise him for his goodness. He's always doing something good. Share the best and worst parts of your day with each other. This is a great practice for families. Uh, we did this with, with my kids. This is a great thing to do. Like you pick your kids up and you're going home. Um, our, our, our crew groups do this often. Highs and lows, we call them. Our young people talk about highs and lows. Let's go. I talk about highs and lows. I like to throw in, if you have younger students, this works for high school students too, but okay, weirdest thing that happened today. Let's talk about it. What was the weirdest thing that happened? The funniest thing. What, what about, uh, yeah, what was the best thing today? What was the worst thing? What made you glad? What made you sad? Practice this, friends. It's better than a lot of conversation that's going around in, on our, ta in our tables uh, over dinner or something else. If you eat dinner together. Okay, that's another thing. Um, but spending time together, right? And talking about these things. Uh, how about this? Craft intentional unplugged time together without screens this one we could talk about for hours and we do our, our middle schoolers high schoolers our, our, our youth leaders 
all talk about. This is so critical, gang. And parents, grandparents, you've got to research this. There's so much that's being written. You've got to be informed about this. You need to take deep dive into this. Gen Z is the first generation that has actually grown up all their lives with screens. Not like it was introduced at some point along the way. And we're seeing now with devastating results. A lot of work's being done by a lot of intensive research. Jonathan Haidt is, is one that I'm following a lot among others, but he's one who notes, he believes that uh, young people should, teenagers should not have social media at all until they're 16 years old. And even then, like why? Because we're seeing the impact that it's having on our students, negative impact, especially young girls. Parents, establish rules together with your kids, but be the parent. Set restrictions on times and locations. Establish no phone zone where the phones are not in the room. And, and at nighttime, don't let your kids go to bedtime with their screens in the room. I mean, there's just simple things you can do. Establish outdoor play and long periods of free range play outside with kids. And don't let your restrictions be limited to your kids. Model the role. Put your phone down. And you just might engage with your children like you should be. This is not a small matter. And then on the bottom here is, is, is Isaiah 41, uh, 10. Just a great verse that you can hold on to. In fact, memorize as a family. Put this on your fridge. So we're going to close with this. The, the, the problem is alienation. The solution is perseverance. And finally, the hope is healing. Okay? In verse 10, look at this. As with a deadly wound in my bones, my adversaries taunt me while they say to me all the day long, where is your God? Look at this. He feels like he has a mortal wound. If you've ever wrestled with um, an anxiety attack, I've talked to friends and members of our church who have, and, and, and he's, I just felt like I was going to die. And I'm like, okay, but like, what do you mean? Like, that's not logical. No, it's not logical, but I felt literally like I was going to die in the moment. And some of you have been there. This is what the psalmist is going through. Can you imagine? Let's write a song about this, right? It's amazing. And it's here in the Word of God teaching us that, that oftentimes, again, who are these adversaries coming at him? They could be real voices, but likely they, they could they be temptations to self-medicate or enter, enter into unhealthy habits. Or could it be um, in our own heads that we're, we're listening to the lies of the adversary? There is an adversary, by the way. There is an accuser. You know this. And he seeks to steal, kill, and destroy and this is what he's doing in regard to mental health. It's a part of living in this fallen world. And it needs to be addressed by spiritual uh, forces and the word of God. Look at verse 11. Why are you cast down, O my soul? And why are you in turmoil within me? Hope in God, for I shall again praise him, my salvation and my God. He comes back to the refrain. Look at this. The gospel resounds off of this chorus. His, look at this. His, his circumstances haven't changed. He's not feeling better. It's not that it's been resolved. But look at this. This is not wishful thinking. Don't miss this, friends. Biblical hope is rooted in reality. He ends with a statement of faith which we can all do even today, and it comes from another who suffered before us, long before Jesus shows up. An interesting study, some have noted, you can find almost every one of the last seven words of Jesus in this song. I thirst. Why have you abandoned me? I've got a mortal wound in my bones. Listen, we have a resource that the psalmist did not have. Jesus has come. He was abandoned so that we would never be. He, he, he was really abandoned. He, he was really thirsty. He took on the thirst that comes in a lost world with those who are separated from God. And friends, as you enter into this week, we're going to sing a song together. 
that we want to be just a refrain in your heart and your mind, like, like verse 5, like verse 11. And we're going to proclaim the truth together. This is not self-talk. This is not cognitive behavioral therapy. CBT says, well, I'm a great person and I deserve it. And I'm really happy and I'm going to be happy today. No, that's not what this is. This is speaking truth as a child of God. Romans 8, 16 says the spirit bears witness that I am a child of God and I belong to him. And I'm speaking truth about what I know is true about me. And it's the one who spoke the words, Jesus himself, who said this, if anyone thirst, let him come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow from rivers of living water. See, spiritual thirst is a universal thing and of the human condition. And it's throughout the Bible from Genesis to Revelation where we see the spirit and the bride say, come and let the one who hears say, come and let the one who is thirsty, come. Let the one who desires take the water of life without price. Amen and amen. The grace of God has come to us. And as the deer pants for the waters, our soul cries out to God because he has made us for himself. And you will never find rest until you turn to him and give your life to him. Friends, don't alienate yourself. Persevere with hope and never give up because God, he is our savior and our God. Let's pray together. Lord, we thank you for the truth of your word. We praise you that you are always with us, that you never leave us nor forsake us. Lord, give us the faith that we need as we press into hard times. And I pray for those who are here who need to turn, return to you. Some who need to receive your grace today for the first time. Friend, if you've never have received his grace, do it now. It comes for free. You don't have to do a thing for it, but believe. Jesus took on your sin upon the cross. He died on the cross so that you would be set free. He suffered so that you wouldn't have to suffer. He died so that you would not die. And he was raised again so that you could live in triumphant, resurrected life, even through seasons of doubt, depression, anxiety, and hopelessness. Lord, we thank you. We proclaim it together. You are our salvation and our God. You will hold us fast and you will never let us go. May we encourage each other with that truth as we go into this week. In Jesus' name we pray. Everyone said amen and amen.